it's time to start. And I see also, technically speaking, we are now prepared because this event is live streamed on Facebook and uh, Twitter. First of all, I would like to uh, warmly welcome you all uh, on behalf of the Foreign Policy Forum, um, which has organized this event, a panel discussion on reconciliation policies in Western Balkans in a almost 30 year perspective since the beginning of the hostilities in former Yugoslavia and its successor states as a part of the program, um, uh, the, the, the public diplomacy program, which has been supported by the British Embassy here in uh, Zagreb. This is the second of our events within this program. And maybe some of you remember, well, maybe some of you have attended and know that actually the first one was a month ago, and we discussed that on that occasion, the 25th, um, it, it was to mark the 25th anniversary of the signing of the agreement on normalization of relationship between then Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, consisting of Serbia and Montenegro, and Republic of Croatia. Um, both events show our interest and to a degree also focus on the issues in Western Balkans. Uh, and both open the question of what can be done now in order to improve uh, bilateral relations, but also to resolve some of the outstanding issues that uh, make legacy of the conflicts of the 1990s. Um, I'm particularly uh, happy to uh, welcome the representatives of um, embassies in accredited to Croatia. Um, I'm glad to see here uh, many distinguished guests, ambassadors of Brazil, Japan, Norway, um, and uh, Canada, and also representatives of other embassies, um, um, such as the uh, Czech Republic, um, Ireland, Lithuania, uh, Bulgaria, and Slovakia. Uh, and I apologize if I've missed uh, somebody who's maybe not pre-registered, but uh, uh, is still most welcome, uh, Russia as well, Russian Federation, and so on. Um, also, um, we, uh, we see a lot of, uh, which I'm particularly pleased with, a lot of uh, students uh, studying at Faculties of Political Science and Arts and Humanities. Uh, we will have a small surprise for you at the end of this panel. Um, and so I will not reveal actually what we have prepared, but uh, certainly we, uh, or at least not all what we have prepared, but certainly we would like to encourage uh, particularly students to take part as a new generation and actually would like to see their views as well on the topics discussed uh, here. Uh, without further ado, I have a, a very great honor actually to um, say a word or two about our panelists uh, for today. Um, uh, the, f uh, the first speaker will be Professor Jasna Dragovic Soso um, of uh, Goldsmiths College in London. Professor Soso has been writing about um, the issues of reconciliation, but also the causes as well of the conflict, especially through the role of intellectuals um, in some of the countries of the Western Balkans um, for the last, uh, I think, maybe two decades or so. Um, so she's really uh, extremely well uh, positioned to tell us uh, uh, something about the uh, state of affairs when it comes to reconciliation policies. So we'll start with her and then we will uh, give the floor to uh, Professor Ivo Josipovic, the president of Croatia in the period of 2010 to 2015, um, who is also a professor of international, uh, of international criminal law um, and both as uh, an academic and as president of the Republic and active participant and supporter of civil society in Croatia, he did have a personal experience uh, uh, of which he will, I'm sure, say something about in his own um, intervention uh, later on. Then we will um, uh, move on to uh, Vesna Tershelic's uh, uh, speech. Vesna is the director of Documenta. I don't know of any other organization that has done more in terms of collecting information, but also uh, public advocacy for the issue of justice and reconciliation. Uh, post-conflict. Uh, she was also very much involved in RECOM in an attempt to bring all these various other initiatives together and to create a network that would 
do the same thing within the region. And so we very much look forward to um, Vesna's view on, in particular, on some of the most topical issues that remain, such as the issue of the missing persons, but also um, uh, obstacles to returning of the people and so on and so forth. And we will, at the end, um, give the floor to Professor Eric Gordy, uh, who is of the um, University College London School of Slavonic and East European Studies. Professor Gordy is uh, also uh, a, a very productive author of um, ideas and works uh, related to a wide range of uh, issues in Southeast Europe, both in terms of politics and society. Uh, he just completed one of the this Horizons 2020 right, projects, um, which was focused on informality in politics in Western Balkans. But prior to this, he also wrote extensively on the Hague Tribunal and issues of uh, the link between culture and the ideology and politics in the Western Balkans. Uh, well, that would be all uh, from my side. So I would like, first of all, to start with uh, uh, Jasna and basically uh, ask uh, the, the, the question of uh, reconciliation uh, policies. And where are these countries of the Western Balkans? And, and also, where is Croatia? I'm taking Croatia slightly out of this concept. Um, of Western Balkans uh, with regard to reconciliation up to the wars of the 1990s. Are they really focused now on creating solid grounds for permanent peace? Is permanent peace ever possible after all? Or on the contrary, are they using previous conflicts as an obstacle to reconciliation? Yes, no. Okay. Thank you very much, Dayan, for inviting me to Zagreb after a long time a long time being anywhere really other than London at home. Um, and I'm really, really pleased to be here with this um, great panel and um, to be able to talk to you and talk with you, I hope, about these issues. Um, so Dan has set us a, a task, which was to deal with a question each and, um, and to do so in a rather succinct way um, so that we can have more time for discussion afterwards. So I've prepared something on this first question, which he just read out to you, about where are we at the moment uh, with uh, questions of reconciliation and sustainable peace in the region. And I think to answer this question, we probably should just take a moment to briefly reflect about what is actually meant by reconciliation and by sustainable peace. Um, and just very, very briefly, I will first um, unpack some of these assumptions here before we we get going on the more sort of empirical historical aspects. Um, now, the notion of a sustainable peace um, arose from the definitions of a positive peace as opposed to just the absence of conflict, um, as was conceptualized by um, scholars such as Johann Galtung or Kenneth Boulding in the 1970s and 1980s. And by the early 1990s, um, large-scale quantitative studies um, showed that there were several regions in the world that kept experiencing cycles of conflict and protracted conflict. So the notion of a sustainable peace um, came from there and essentially represents the idea that you need to break with these cycles um, and with these recurrences of conflict in a given region. This then brings us to the second concept, which is that of reconciliation. And the idea that became prominent, particularly um, in the post-Cold War period, was that one important way of achieving sustainable peace was to apply the essentially psychosocial notion of reconciliation, which was drawn originally from interpersonal relations to the collective level of states and societies. In the scholarly literature, you will find different definitions of reconciliation. However, most of the literature usually refers to something that has to do with rebuilding of a relationship that has been broken. And as you can see, the underlying assumption here is that reconciliation is not about disengaging from others, but about re-engaging and engaging to establish relationships of peace, mutual understanding, and respect. 
So John Paul Lederach, for example, he's a well-known scholar of um, peace building and also a practitioner. Um, he defines reconciliation as a social space in which the, I'm quoting him, the acknowledgement of the past and envisioning of the future is a necessary ingredient for reframing the present. And as you can see immediately, um, there is a temporal element here um, that creates a continuum between the past, the present, and the future. And this temporal element is actually quite important. And I think it's worth perhaps pausing here for just a minute um, to ask a question about this. Um, and this is a question that I think pertains to this region in particular. Considering that the future, a vision of the future, is something that is absolutely key in reconciliation, um, we need to ask, I think, that whether, when defining their interests and goals over the last 20 years, have political actors in this region actually had a vision of that future that encompassed others in the region. And it seems to me that some degree of this future vision actually conditions the other part of reconciliation, which concerns the questions of the past. In other words, without a clear desire to establish a future in which relations with the other former Yugoslav nations and states play a role, then what would be the point of embarking on a difficult and, um, and painful process of dealing with the past, with the recent past of war and human rights abuses and crimes? Now, when it comes to dealing with the past, I would also like to introduce a third concept, which is that of transitional justice. Now, transitional justice, as I hope you're all probably familiar, um, is defined by the United Nations as, I'm quoting, the full range of processes and mechanisms associated with a society's attempts to come to terms with a legacy of large-scale past abuses in order to ensure accountability, serve justice, and achieve reconciliation. Um, these processes and mechanisms include things such as trials, truth commissions, vetting or illustration policies, apologies, amnesties, education, as well as practices of memorialization, in other words, memory policy. And the underlying assumption here is the notion that difficult and conflictual pasts need to be brought to light and worked through. And this emerged out of the experiences of the 1990s, particularly in Latin America and South Africa. But the scholarship also looked further back uh, to the post-Second World War period, and in particular, the experience of Germany, um, notably referring to the Nuremberg Tribunal, Franco-German reconciliation, and Billy Brunt's iconic NIFO um, at the Warsaw Ghetto Memorial, which served as symbols of what a successful case of reconciliation and sustainable peace looked like. In fact, the very notion of working through the past or coming to terms with the past derives from the German experience. One thing I think I should mention before we then move to this region is uh, the first part of that notion of transitional justice, namely the notion of transition. As mentioned, approaches to dealing with the past have historically been linked to political transitions from authoritarian rule to democratic rule. Justice and reconciliation are therefore directly linked to the establishment of democracy. But how does this linkage actually work? When do, we need when do we need justice and reconciliation for the building of democracy? Or are there perhaps times when trade-offs are necessary, as some scholars have argued, um, that took place, for example, in West, post-war West Germany, when the Adenauer government privileged the building of democracy over dealing with Germany's national socialist past. So from these sort of general, more theoretical remarks, I will now move to the empirical, and I will focus my remarks around two concepts when I look at the region, both of which are essential ingredients of any definition of reconciliation. The first of these is the concept of knowledge production, and I prefer this 
term to the usually accepted term, which is truth-telling in transitional justice. And the second term is that of acknowledgement. In other words, acceptance of having caused harm to, the, to others, as well as some form of social official atonement for it. And my overall argument, I would say, is that there has been an enormous amount of the former and very little of the latter, which in some sense is the paradox of this region. So let me elaborate a little bit. So the first point is that there has certainly been an amazing amount of knowledge production about the wars of the 1990s, particularly when it comes to questions of human rights violations and war crimes. The first source of such knowledge production are, of course, judicial institutions. And when it comes to the wars of the 1990s, the foremost institution I think we need to consider is the ICTY, the Criminal Tribunal. Now, the ICTY has been extensively criticized in the literature, mainly in regard to its indictment policy, the problems with its trial processes, and, of course, its judgments and sentencing. And these criticisms, I think, are valid and important. However, this doesn't change the fact that a huge amount of information has come out of the ICTY's trials and that it represents a vast repository of knowledge about the wars, about the role of different actors, and it considers the role, for example, not only of regular army and police units, but also of paramilitaries, the links between these actors and state institutions, as well as specificities about a large number of crimes that were committed. Secondly, the work of NGOs in the region has been extremely important and extensive in the production of knowledge about the wars. And here, I'm very pleased to see Vesna at this panel because her organization, Documenta, has been absolutely crucial in this process, along with the humanitarian law centers in Belgrade and Pristina, or, for example, the Sarevo Research and Documentation Center, which pioneered the work of creating a database um, of individuals who had been killed during the war in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Thanks to their work, we now have a pretty good sense of how many people were actually killed in the wars. And most of these have been named and their fate is contained in the databases of these organizations. We also have databases that um, show the locations of detention centers, mass graves, and also of other specific sites in localities and villages where people died, providing a sense of the dynamics of the conflicts and crimes over time and over geographical space. And I think this work would not have been possible without the extensive collaboration that these NGOs had with each other and with other uh, groups in the region, such as victim associations, uh, throughout many, many years. Thirdly, Institutions such as the ICMP in Bosnia and Herzegovina and other state organizations have provided information about missing persons. And it appears um, that, I think I saw the last statistics for 2019, more than 70% of missing persons from the Yugoslav wars have been accounted for, which is actually quite remarkable. It is the most uh, in, of any other conflict in the world. Fourth, there have also been, of course, exceptional instances of investigative journalism. For example, I'm thinking here of some of the documentaries that were shown on B92 and other television networks, and also by press journalists uh, in the region, um, as well as internationally. Some crimes were initially unearthed by investigative journalists, as well as some of the links between paramilitary groups and state institutions in the 1990s. And finally, I think it is worth mentioning the work of scholars, many of whom are actually originally from the region, even if they now work in Western Europe and North America. And their work has been valuable in many ways, uh, but also in documenting the micro level, in other words, of people's lived experience uh, of the wars, particularly um, documenting uh, survivors and family members of victims, which has also been done by civil society networks, notably the RECOM 
Re uh, Reconciliation Network, as it's now called. And I have personally participated in some of these sessions uh, where uh, people who had lost um, family um, or had survived crimes um, spoke out and testified about their experiences, which was an extremely moving experience. In sum, as I hope I've convinced you, there is a tremendous amount of knowledge that already exists about the wars of the 1990s, and much of it is in the public domain. I would argue that there is certainly a foundation here for the other aspect of the process, namely for official acknowledgement of wrongdoing and some form of memory policy based on it, which could in turn form the basis for regional reconciliation and sustained peace if we accept that linkage. And then this brings me to my final set of remarks, which is that such official acknowledgement has largely not materialized, and when it did, it has not had a lasting effect. Official acknowledgement can come in different ways. First, it can come through justice policies and policies of blustration and vetting. In other words, through the punishment of perpetrators of crimes or their exclusion from office. And this has obviously been a challenge for countries that have come through a kind of negotiated or pacted transition from the 1990s, and where individuals and organizations from this wartime period still hold power in many instances. More shocking, I think, has been the return of convicted war criminals uh, to positions of responsibility and authority after their release from prison. Secondly, official acknowledgement can come through a truth commission which has been one of the principal mechanisms of transitional justice around the world since the 1990s. And although there have been several attempts in the region to create truth commissions, both on the state level and on the regional level, these have either not materialized or have had little positive impact. The most serious such endeavor was the project for a regional commission, RECOM, which after more than 10 years of consultations and efforts was eventually shelved at the end of 2019. And thankfully, the network that was created through this process still remains. Thirdly, acknowledgement can come via political apologies for the crimes and the losses of the other side. And in a database that has recently been published um, of apologies, political apologies around the world uh, by two researchers at Tilburg University in the Netherlands, uh, Croatia and Serbia actually feature quite prominently, having issued six and five such apologies respectively, um, mainly, I believe, from the efforts of President Josipovic and Tadic. This actually is quite remarkable considering that on average it seems to take more than 40 years for heads of state to offer such apologies. Um, and just as a matter of trivia, I see the Japanese ambassador uh, in the audience. Uh, top of the list is actually held by Japan, which has issued double the number of apologies of, for example, Germany. This is a little known fact, I think. <laughs> um, however, Whatever may have been gained uh, by such apologies at the time when they were issued, I think it would be fair to say that nevertheless, political apologies in the region have not had a long-term transformative effect. Fourth, education policies and teaching materials in the states of the region have tended to reflect nationalist narratives rather than counter them. And policies, for example, of educational segregation in Bosnia and Herzegovina have also gone against the very notion of reconciliation. And finally, official memory policy has also tended to reflect nationalist narratives of both the wars of the 1990s and earlier history. There have, of course, been some counter-narratives that have arisen, mainly through the cultural production and through civil society activism. But my impression is that these initiatives have not had a wider social impact. Instead, they mainly worked to bring together people who already ascribe to a human rights discourse. So to briefly conclude, my answer to the question that Dayan asked is that overall, 
Despite a tremendous amount of knowledge production about the wars, transitional justice in the region has failed as a project of reconciliation and sustainable peace building, at least in this point in time. And I think the latest buildup of tensions in Kosovo and in Bosnia and Herzegovina is testimony to that fact. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jasna, for such a comprehensive and uh, really detailed and thought-provoking, challenging uh, introduction, which in many ways go, goes against uh, some of the you know, usual ways people think of either the transitional justice or, or the role of ICTY, uh, either that they underestimate the work that has been done or maybe that they overestimate the results of, uh, of all this. So I think this leaves us really with a lot of questions and the good questions for further discussion. Now, speaking of apologies, I owe one actually to our good friend, Italian ambassador, uh, Pier Francesco Sacco. Uh, I, I failed to, to actually uh, welcome you at the beginning, so most, uh, most being most welcome and, uh, uh, into this event, and thank you for coming as well. Um, okay, I think it's now time to, to move on to uh, President Josipovic. Um, and uh, my question really to him would be uh, focused on the Hague Tribunal and the ICTY. Uh, and we have heard now that the ICTY has done a lot, of, a lot of things, but the fact is, what do you think is the legacy of the Hague Tribunal, uh, its trials and, and judgments uh, for reconciliation policies in the Western Balkans? And has this job that has been done, has it been enough in a way? or not with regard to its own stated objectives and expectations. So how would history judge the Hague Tribunal? Thank you for inviting me. So uh, I had the opportunity to participate in the Hague Affair in different capacities. Uh, firstly, I was a member of NGOs uh, asking for establishment of the International Court. There was a meeting in Fribourg and from that meeting, uh, NGOs from all countries, right from former Yugoslavia, asked uh, UN to establish such tribunal. And so um, I'm, I was very happy with when uh, the, the court was uh, established, really. Secondly, I was engaged as a lawyer and a professor. Uh, for me, as a criminal lawyer, as professor of criminal law, international criminal law, uh, appearance of uh, the ICTY was something as a, a new dinosaur for, for uh, historians or archaeologists. So it was very interesting for me because new phenomena was coming on the scene with uh, many interesting issues, legal issues, practical issues. And of course, I was uh, engaged uh, as politician and even before I became the president and during my presidency. Uh, then uh, for me, the other modalities were more, more interested like uh, cooperation with President Tadic uh, or with President Napolitano concerning the Second World War. But the Hague was still important. Unfortunately, I think the Hague is not important anymore, the ICTY. Uh, now, uh, somehow, uh, many circumstances led to a situation that it's out of focus. It's really out of focus, for, especially for, for uh, politicians in, in uh, respected countries here. So, uh, what is the outcome? Yes, uh, the, the, the tribunal sentenced uh, many war criminals. About 100, I don't know exact number. Um, yes, uh, the, the, the uh, ICTY was some kind of uh, entrance door for the ICC. It was also very important. Also, the ICTY influenced local courts and local legislation. I can witness what happened in Croatia. Uh, but uh, the, the, the final outcome is unfortunately limited. It's limited uh, for different reasons. Firstly, uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, there were too many cases. Too many cases, some of them 
uh, not really what statute ask that means the top level of responsible person uh, many many cases were against uh, completely unnecessary unimportant local killers and that was not the main idea of the tribunal the tribunal was created to to prosecute the most responsible that's the wording of the, the statute the most responsible uh, how it happened that the, the, the tribunal started with Dusko Tadic, who is, generally speaking, really criminal, but not important person in the meaning of statute, uh, probably because there were no other cases. So the, the, the tribunal uh, should start with something, and then the Tadic was uh, available from Germany, so they decided to prosecute Tushko Tadic. Oh. But that was, Tadic case was typical one for national court, not for the ICTY. So the ICTY lost quite a lot uh, time on not so important cases. Secondly, uh, I was not very convinced in preparation of some cases. So uh, cases lasted too long even Shesha's case is unacceptable how long it lasted. That means uh, uh, it was not prepared properly. And secondly, thirdly, or I don't know which point, is that um, being burdened by, by weaknesses of uh, evidence uh, and uh, by, by obstruction of the states, the obstruction was visible, clear visible, uh, they invented one tool that does not exist in criminal law in any country. It's the third, uh, third modality of uh, joint criminal enterprise. You cannot find it in any legislation. So uh, when uh, enemies of international justice want to attack the ICTY and its legacy, they always point those, those weaknesses. For me, they are obvious, but uh, unfortunately, I think that benefits from the ICTY uh, are much uh, more important than weaknesses. In spite, the war criminals are still heroes in respective countries, that uh, some of them are already involved in politics again, uh, that national courts are not following truly uh, the criteria from the ICTY and so on. Uh, but uh, the most important weakness is that uh, general audience, not specialists and human rights activists like you or uh, Mrs. Kandic or the others, we are, uh, uh, so uh, the general audience still think that just the others performed war crimes, just others, and all our people before the tribunal or before national courts are heroes, and uh, the proceedings are improper towards them. And that's the, the biggest uh, disadvantage of, of international justice. Why it happened? Firstly, I think uh, because of uh, partiality and, and uh, obstruction from politics and partly from media as well, local media. And generally speaking, also the, the general surrounding of international justice was not in favor of uh, the ICTY because uh, unfortunately even you can recognize it in the statute of ICC uh, the international community especially big powers didn't want to accept the same criteria of responsibility for themselves as for those Balkans of this African people in uh, frames of, of the ICC. Uh, but I'm a realist. Realist, that means that uh, I'm aware of the fact that uh, international criminal law is developing. And uh, the IC ICTY is one of the first steps, was really, really important. And especially in one period of Croatian history, the influence of the ICTY was very positive. Because the ICTY pushed Croatian governments not one of them, uh, to think about responsibility, to 
make some positive moves uh, concerning uh, local courts and uh, some local processes. Not enough, but yes, uh, it was influenced by the ICTY. In Serbia, there is a special court with relatively good results, but not expecting uh, common responsibility properly as the ICTY uh, is doing that. And um, finally, um, when you ask me whether I'm uh, happy, satisfied or not, yes, I'm satisfied that the ICTY was established, but unfortunately, uh, I think that uh, this is a, that was more perspective tool than the result. Uh, I'm one of those uh, lawyers, enthusiasts who think that the future of international justice uh, is uh, very good, but not in several decades. Uh, I think that uh, the future of justice must be based in international community as well, not only before local courts. And so uh, I'm not so happy that, uh, about the fact that, uh, that the ICTY didn't produce uh, so many advantages that I expected. So uh, I have to stress that uh, during all this period, uh, the most important uh, input in all this uh, justice issue was done by NGOs. And it's very, very important. Vesna Tersharic uh, and Documenta, not only Documenta, but Documenta is the most important NGO, uh, really contributed. And, uh, but they're not uh, celebrated by right wing and uh, other nationalists and people who think that all Croats are heroes, all Croats are all criminals, and vice versa as well. Uh, and that was the reason that I, as a president, decorated uh, Vesna and Documenta. And I was, of course, heavily criticized uh, by part of Croatian audience. Uh, so um, I think that. Uh, NGOs should continue their work. Uh, unfortunately, uh, and that's, uh, this is the fact that I was not happy about, is that international justice is going to be relatively soon without the ICTY. It's going to be closed. And uh, the general successor of this idea, the ICC, unfortunately is not fulfilling uh, I think any reasonable expectation about the justice. Uh, so uh, it's functioning more or less as a justice for African leaders. And in the same period we have Guantanamo, we still have Guantanamo, we still have wars, we keep killing uh, concentration camps, but definitely uh, still we do not have the same criteria all around the world. And that it, I hope that the time will come that we will have many documentas, many Vesna Tershalic, many uh, Natasha Kandic and the others uh, capable to uh, distinguish politics, daily politics from responsibility, uh, from need to reconciliate, to reconciliate uh, between states and nations. And um, so I'm supporting you still. And I hope that even uh, uh, conferences like this one will contribute to this noble idea of peace, uh, reconciliation, and against uh, cruels like we witnessed uh, during the war uh, in this region. For me, uh, the most shocking uh, thing is not, yes, it's terrible. Uh, some of political ideas performed by some politicians are really, but really terrible. But even more shocking for me is the fact that it was possible that people who lived door to door performed such cruelty. It's, it's for me, it's incredible. Uh, for me, it's something that, of course, supported by different politics and politicians, but also it shows that uh, people and humanity 
didn't learn anything from history. And that's, uh, for me, the most pessimistic conclusion. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Josipovic. It was really interesting to hear really this view on the um, civil society sector and ICTY uh, from somebody who is also the head of state. Uh, so uh, really interesting to hear how actually the importance of the civil society has been emphasized here in this, in this context. Okay, um, this Natasha Lich uh, is a, uh, was actually the uh, activist in the anti-war campaign in the early 1990s and, uh, and then a long-standing really, I think, uh, participant and key participant in some of these uh, efforts to resolve or at least to address uh, some of the most problematic and most traumatic uh, episodes or issues from, from the war of the 1990s. So my question to Vesna actually is, you know, what issues remain open from previous conflicts and need to be addressed by states involved primarily? So let's just, you know, turn these things upside down in a way, you know, that somebody from civil society primarily talks about what states can do um, in this process. And in particular, Really, we would like to, to hear something uh, from you and to discuss later on the issue of the missing persons, which is becoming also a foreign policy issue, bilateral issue in relationship, in particular with Serbia, but also to a degree with other uh, successor countries. So how should the states, in your view, approach this, this issue? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation and being here. Uh, and uh, first of all, I believe states should address the issues of uh, justice, uh, search for forcibly disappeared, and uh, reconciliation and trust building processes with much more serious efforts. So as uh, we already heard uh, about lack of official uh, acknowledgement, I would also add lack of social acknowledgement and lack of neighborly uh, acknowledgement, especially where actually crimes have been committed in smaller or bigger towns and eventually uh, survivors and perpetrators knew each other and still know each other and might keep not saying hello to each other. Uh, and it is that uh, when we heard this uh, fantastic introduction on reconciliation policy, one might get the impression there have been so many reconciliation policies, what a richness and uh, what a uh, uh, huge amount of efforts done. Uh, and eventually it is true that if we look at transitional justice uh, and what was done concerning judicial proceedings, that uh, maybe in uh, this region, uh, in post Yugoslav countries, on the level of uh, prosecution uh, at tribunal and domestic courts, more was done than in any other country. Uh, maybe you can compare it with Argentina eventually because they had very intense domestic prosecution of crimes committed during dictatorship. But the question remains how much influence that had. And I would say that a very important policy of European Union uh, was conditionality related to Hague Tribunal and conditionality related to, to rule of law. So I'll just briefly look at that, as uh, it was really uh, very important for tribunal that this kind of support came in sense of uh, paying a very serious attention, uh, both on the level of United Nations, the reports, uh, of prosecutor and president of tribunal have been presented, and on the level of European Union, which was not obliged, but have chosen to eventually look very seriously on conditionality. And here I was, would respectfully disagree with President Josipovic about uh, the importance of legacy, saying that uh, maybe uh, the legacy is seen from our point of view as societies, individuals, uh, experts, activists, as not so important now. But uh, a pool of facts established beyond reasonable doubt at uh, 
a tribunal uh, in uh, the still ongoing proceedings, as Stanisic and Simatovic still to be seen in the uh, final stage of procedure, uh, is eventually uh, a rich source which maybe someday will lead also to education materials which would have uh, included these facts. And here I would especially like to mention that uh, for me, the very important achievement is that uh, both killers and the responsible uh, leaders have been prosecuted. Of course, I regret that uh, Mr. Milosevic have died in custody without the final verdict, but I think that the verdicts which are there clearly link uh, uh, actually uh, committed crimes uh, against uh, civilians and prisoners of war, and we should recall that uh, according to data collected by human rights organizations, uh, more than 130,000 uh, people have been either killed or are still forcibly disappeared. So is that uh, not all of that have been war crimes? Uh, some have been killed in, uh, in action. Uh, military action, uh, but it is that uh, the very serious crimes have been committed and these crimes were linked also with Mr. Milosevic and to uh, leadership of uh, Mr. Tuzman in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So that it's not just that uh, the facts have been established about single crimes, but there was a clear picture about the system which supported emerging of that crimes. And I don't think so this can be just obliterated. And I think that's important legacy. But the fact that legacy is maybe not seen as so important currently tells really more about us than about tribunal. I'm far from saying the tribunal was perfect because it was not. And I'm not going now in nitty gritty of all the uh, challenges, but uh, I would here like to mention Sense Center for Transitional Justice and Mirko Klarin, who was sitting during proceedings in Haag, uh, kind of like being merely one of the imprisoned persons, although just being excellent journalist, uh, and eventually left us rich uh, documentation, not just of what is already online from tribunal, but through journalists' eye summarized what is the most important and then through internet narratives eventually made it much more available to public uh, on the global level. But unfortunately, maybe today's students in uh, different countries around the world uh, actually use it more than we use it here uh, because the initiative to establish information centers uh, of tribunal have been realized just in Sarajevo and not in other post Yugoslav countries, uh, and even in Sarajevo it's sort of uh, not really utilized. So it's, you know, we can discuss this if you're interested in discussion. Uh, tribunal gave also very important impulse to uh, domestic uh, courts and uh, prosecutions and investigations continue, uh, observed by lawyers, you see Elena Djokicjovic from Documenta here who monitored so many war crimes uh, and still monitored by Veselinka Kastratovic from Center for Peace in Josiek, as well as colleagues from Humanitarian Law Center uh, in Belgrade and colleagues from uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina still monitoring war crimes trials. As Bosnia and Herzegovina remains most vivid in continuation of prosecution uh, of war crimes, Croatia, after joining European Union, stagnating uh, roughly at around 30 uh, cases per year, with less cases against uh, members uh, of uh, Croatian uh, uh, units uh, in the last years, and uh, not that they're known, but uh, surely they're less. And what is especially uh, of concern is that many are, uh, many cases, many uh, trials are held uh, in absentia, while uh, eventually the indictees leave either in Serbia or in Bosnia and Herzegovina, all the original cooperation on prosecution of war crimes have been eventually quite 
well prepared on the level of prosecutors, state attorneys uh, during uh, EU integration process of Croatia, this have not developed in the direction uh, which was expected. And the European Union is not looking anymore so much on Croatia as their EU member. Although lately there is a new mechanism of monitoring rule of law developed, which gives us some hope. So it's that uh, here we see stagnation uh, concerning search for forcibly disappeared. Uh, it is that uh, when you recall that in the moment of finishing wars, uh, whatever we consider that was the moment war in Bosnia and Herzegovina being uh, ended in armed uh, struggle uh, phase in 95, then in Kosovo in 98, but Macedonia only 2001, uh, it is that uh, there are, there were around 40,000 forcibly disappeared, and the numbers came uh, down to a really much smaller number. Uh, due to work of International Commission on Missing Persons and uh, national uh, teams of uh, either in Croatia uh, inside Ministry of Croatian War Veterans or uh, individual commissions on level of countries, uh, which is also one of the most spectacular search efforts in history. So you might say, okay, but if uh, so much was done judicially and uh, if so much was done in sense of search for missing, why uh, are we not better in trust building and reconciliation? Because we expected much more. As societies and uh, I would say institutions in our countries, but on first place maybe, survivors and victims expected much more from justice mechanisms and uh, search for missing. Uh, but the answer is really that there are reconciliation policies which have not been uh, eventually pursued. So it's in sense of truth telling, in sense of developing education tools. Although we uh, advocated RECOM as regional commission which would produce uh, a common narration on what happened and the crimes which have been done, uh, it is that there was not sufficient political will from side of President Josipovic and uh, President Tadic will came, it came from side of Montenegro and even from Kosovo and Macedonia, but it was never there really from Bosnia and Herzegovina, Croatia and Slovenia. And here I would like to underline that two countries being members of European Union, uh, Slovenia and Croatia didn't have really understanding on level of government. So we continue as human rights organizations collecting data on uh, fate of uh, killed and forcibly disappeared and gradually publish it. It's not yet finished research, but hopefully it will be. And hopefully in near future, uh, the uh, uh, institution in Croatia working with it, Memorial and Documentation Center of Homeland War, which collects data and mostly bases it on official sources, which is perfectly complementary to what Documenta does, will maybe start cooperating with us because our speciality is field research. We have interviewed more than 7,000 uh, family members and survivors uh, and it would make all sense to connect this data. So this cooperation between civil society organizations and scientific and governmental institutions doesn't function. In Croatia, uh, search for uh, missing is still ongoing for 1,800 58 persons. It is a sad uh, number and uh, soon uh, on anniversary of uh, fall of Vukovar, uh, we will hear more about it. Unfortunately, regional cooperation is not good enough in that issue also, as it was not good enough in matters of return of minority population and uh, there have been legal obstacles in the 90s, but then later all kind of practical obstacles, so it remained an open issue. But finally, I would like to uh, put additional light to uh, the difficulties related to lack of localization of remembrance uh, policy or policies. So it's that European Union uh, has a whole segment of work 
uh, devoted to European remembrance, which civil society organizations utilize in challenging revisionism connected to Second World War or challenging forgetfulness related to Goli Otok and uh, consequences of political violence during Yugoslav socialism or challenging uh, the lack of didactic tools related to uh, the wars of 90s. Uh, so it's that uh, I would say that there is huge interest between teachers, although they are not really encouraged to uh, intensely lecture about the 90s. We can uh, look in the textbooks. Uh, Croatia uh, and uh, Serbia have got new history textbooks this autumn. There was still not sufficient time to really analyze it very detailedly. I would say that uh, they're better in treatment of history of Second World War than in uh, treatment of uh, the 90s or Homeland War. Uh, which is sad uh, because uh, once upon a time the effort was done to prepare a good supplement uh, on uh, Homeland War by uh, Tvrtkoja, Kovina, Snežena, Koren and Magdalena Najbar uh, Agičeć, which in the meantime is sidelined. It was actually never published officially, but it was published by Documenta. So it's that uh, the uh, unusual uh, statement, unusual in declaration, which was passed uh, in uh, Croatia on Homeland War in 2000 and later uh, declaration on uh, military operation storm, which was passed in Croatian uh, parliament, have been actually used to somehow canonize a very simplified version of Homeland War and the struggle, the memory struggle, which is still being fought, is uh, around complexity of the character of war, uh, which was obviously a war with elements of aggression uh, of Yugoslav army and Serbian uh, units. Uh, obviously, uh, Vukovar and Dubrovnik have been uh, destroyed uh, in aggression, but definitely uh, war in Croatia, and I would say also in Bosnia and Herzegovina, definitely had elements of civil war. And this is something that is very difficult for our societies to swallow. So unfortunately, uh, we still are searching for ways to, uh, to look honestly with all the details on multi-layered uh, legacy of past, uh, of 20th century. We still find it difficult in many classes and sometimes when uh, serious conferences are being held to address Holocaust, it's not just about 90s, it's also about Holocaust, genocide of Serbs, genocide of Roma, history of Second World War, and European Union, it's not always helpful with uh, its approach to, you know, simplified uh, condemnation of authoritarian to totalitarian regimes, somehow providing formula to our not very keen, uh, in most cases, right-wing politicians who eventually just come on the commemoration place and simply say, we regret all crimes of totalitarian and authoritarian regimes. What is very important is to localize. So it's to say in this village, in this town, what happened in the Second World War is exactly that and that and that. These were the victims, these were the perpetrators. Uh, and to eventually thematize uh, crimes in their own context because they're different, and we are still not mature enough for that. And I'm saying that European Union in that part of its policies is not so, how to say, clear in what uh, might be a future direction. So it is, that, uh, it is that European dealing with the past policies have recently uh, received a boost, uh, but mostly related to the legacy of colonialism, which is not so how to say, first issue on priority list in post-Yugoslav countries. And European Union with uh, uh, recent and not so recent consistency regarding integration of Western Balkans surely makes a lot of steps in the wrong direction. And it is that I think what would be very helpful for reconciliation for all post-Yugoslav countries would be that 
countries which are not members of European Union are on one side supported in meeting criteria, but on the other side actually encouraged. Because unfortunately, position of uh, Western Balkan countries is more looking like position of Turkey than position of Croatia and Serbia, when, uh, Croatia and uh, Slovenia, when we have been in process of European uh, integration, and that is very unfortunate. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Vesna, for your um, very helpful views on, on what, what can be done. I mean, some of these issues, such as the missing persons, is really becoming, as I said, basically a bilateral issue and an issue of foreign policy. And uh, I wonder whether we have come to an end to, in terms of like finding missing persons, as said as it might be, or whether more can be done, in fact, in the future. But that's something that we can certainly come back to later on in a, in a discussion. Um, well, uh, it's now Eric's time, and uh, I would like to uh, invite him somehow to tell us a little bit more about is there anything we can recommend uh, to states and perhaps other actors which create public opinion, for example, uh, including various positive or negative pressures on uh, government, um, especially when it comes to, the, so therefore, the states of the Western Balkans. We heard some of the issues with the European Union's lack of policy or having the wrong policy or maybe wrong emphasis on some of these issues, and including Croatia, of course, in order to further encourage them um, to promote peace and cooperation and basically to move beyond these negative or simplified uh, narratives about um, the past. So um, is there anything you, you think we can, we can recommend? Thank you, Dan. And uh, before I start, I'd just like to uh, to thank Dan and, and the Foreign Policy Forum for inviting um, uh, my friend Yasna and me to uh, to come here and, uh, and and talk to you. I know, especially under these conditions, uh, Dan, when he announced the event, underlined the fact that people would actually be present. And uh, um, for me, this is the first time I have traveled since the beginning of the pandemic last March. There was a good year or so when we didn't leave our neighborhoods at all. Um, so I'm very happy to come to Zagreb. I would be very happy to come absolutely anywhere, um, but I'm especially fond of Zagreb. <laughs> um, and, and I'm happy to observe that after all this time, the world is still very nice. Um, so uh, yes, the question that I've got is, uh, um, is what recommendations I would make, especially to states. And uh, this is a question that I'm a, a little bit uncomfortable answering, I think, first of all, because it's not my position to make recommendations to, uh, um, to states. And there's really no reason that states would listen to any, uh, to any recommendations that I would make. I think first they would ask, how many divisions do the sociologists have? Uh, I mean, but I think there's another element here, too. That is, if we look particularly at the recent behavior in relation to these issues on the part of people in positions of political power, um, you come to wonder whether there's any point in, uh, in offering recommendations to, uh, to states. I mean, to give somebody advice, they have to want this advice. Um, and to imagine, for example, giving advice to Dodik on how to achieve reconciliation, um, there are people who might say this is not the best possible use of energy uh, because we have really seen a deterioration to the degree that political will ever existed on, on the field of, of reconciliation, achieving mutual um, recognition of, of people on both sides of, uh, of divides and, and experiences. Um, to the degree that that political will ever existed, it has uh, severely deteriorated in, in visible ways in the, last, uh, in the last several years. And here, I, mean, I know it is always very easy to come into this kind of discussion and to blame politicians for failing to act or sometimes for making things worse. But, but this is a point that I don't want to dwell on. I mean, I, I think particularly when we have here on this panel, one of the politicians who put considerable energy into trying to disrupt the, uh, um, the cycle of, of 
reforming and recreating divisions. Um, I think finding also that there were some limitations to, uh, um, to this process. Um, we also need to recognize that the space that is available to political leaders to act is constrained. And one of the reasons that space is constrained is because of the character of political discourse in most, probably all of the states of the region. Um, when we talk about things like not only control of media, but, uh, but who is given prominence in, in various institutions of public discussion, it seems to be that discourse about the recent past is dominated by groups that are probably much more vocal than they are representative. Um, I think the experience of talking to, uh, to people on the level of, uh, of the everyday, um, really on all sides of all of the borders in the region, um, your general tendency is to come across people who are basically all right and who are willing to understand across the, um, the divides of different experience. And this disappears when you enter the world of, of public discourse. There you encounter people who are basically not all right. Um, so this is what I will say about, uh, about domestic political structures and, and why there might not be as much point as there appears to be in engaging them. But I also want to step back here as an outsider and, uh, and make an observation that not all of the difficulties in the process that we have experienced originate with political structures or with political leaders in the region. Um, we have already heard several critiques of, of institutions like the International Criminal Tribunal. Um, and this is an institution that can certainly be, be criticized. Most of the criticisms are valid. You can also say that like any institution, um, in the end, when you evaluate it, you'll say that it did some things well and some things badly. Um, I want to look at this process of international uh, pressure toward justice from a different angle, from a sociological angle, and ask this question. Who was involved in the process of trying to achieve reconciliation through institutions of criminal justice? And if we look at this, if we look at the kind of communication that took place, communication took place between the tribunal, on a certain level, the Security Council of the United Nations, uh, some intergovernmental institutions like the European Union, uh, politicians at the top level of states and of, uh, and of state institutions like, uh, like ministries, and a relatively small selection of organizations from civil society that were engaged in documentation and pressure and so on. Now, we look at this, we can say a lot of things about the way that this communication took place between people in these, uh, um, in these various institutions, um, but I'll make just two observations about it. One is that if we're talking about how deeply it, uh, it extends into the society, it does not extend very deeply. We're really talking about um, people at the top levels of, of institutions here. And the second is that the circles in which communications took place were relatively closed. You would occasionally find out about the processes that were happening from media when information got to media, usually just before or after major events. But communication with the public was limited. Communication on the parts of the institutions that I've just, uh, um, that I've just enumerated with the public was, uh, was limited. Um, but, uh, but communication with the public on the part of other institutions that were not directly involved were less limited. And here I think we especially have to talk about media um, and media that is subject to forms of fairly limited control as, uh, um, as we see again throughout the region, that is the lack of communication of the actors responsible for the development of events with the public, with their clients, open space for this discourse to be dominated by other actors which had the tendency to, uh, um, to be partial and tendentious. I'm, I'm trying to be delicate here. Uh, and what this, uh, what this led to was very often on the public, uh, on the part of the public, or of, uh, or of some very 
vocal parts of the public, um, a tendency to approach events related to justice in a spirit that is similar to the way that supporters of the teams approach football matches, um, to look at, uh, at events that take place as a victory for one side or a defeat for another side, and to celebrate or, or lament them uh, accordingly. Um, so there was a relationship to, to victims and, and perpetrators that was similar to the relationship that, uh, um, that supporters have to their teams that developed over time. And I think that this was compounded with the behavior of some international institutions. And uh, here I think that, uh, um, that Europe, the European Union, might be worth um, singling out. Uh, who appeared to retreat from some of their values as the process developed, to, uh, um, to go easy on demands for justice, to go easy on demands for equality and the building of equal relations in, uh, in, in the post-conflict environment. Um, this is probably represented reasonably well um, by the visible absence of pressure for movement for uh, um, for electoral and constitutional reform in the wake of, uh, um, of decisions like the, uh, um, the European Court of Human Rights decisions in the Zornich and in the Sejic and Finci cases in, uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. There's another dimension of this that is probably worth at least raising. Um, and this is one of the reasons why the term transitional justice has become unpopular in the region, as has the term reconciliation. Um, and it is the implication that transitional justice carries with it some elements of transition. Now, when we say transition, what we usually mean to imply is a transition to some form of liberal democratic society. Um, that is, it is a term that is loaded with an ideological meaning. Now, the ideology of liberalism, like all ideologies, um, contains within it a contradiction. Um, and here is what I think is the basic contradiction in the ideology of liberalism, is that liberalism is very, very good at establishing formal legal means of recognition of and realization of equality um, through the recognition of political and civil rights and so on. And it is very, very bad at, uh, at encouraging and establishing and, uh, um, and consolidating relations of material equality, uh, and that this becomes apparent in the ways in which processes of transitional justice, while often setting a good historical record, um, ignore or fail to address the needs of survivors or, uh, or victims. Uh, now, what does this come down to when we talk about states? Um, the first suggestion that I would offer when we talk about states is maybe for a while we might not want to talk about states. Um, that is to say that a lot of this process has been burdened and the negative evaluations that you've been hearing of it have been the product of the fact that we are expecting things from states that they do not want to do and, uh, and are probably in some measure not capable of doing. Um, so the biggest suggestion I would make here is that we need more engagement on the part of society. I mean, when I spoke about failure of communication and of the activity of transitional justice taking place in closed circles, um, institutions that were excluded from these closed circles are the institutions that enjoy the highest levels of trust, at least if surveys are to be believed, in all of the societies of the region. And these are not political institutions, you know, politicians, political parties, representative institutions like, uh, like parliaments, these all receive very low levels of trust in surveys. The institutions that receive the highest levels of trust are institutions like education, religion, arts and culture. Um, and these are institutions that have been, with some notable exceptions, um, loudly absent from the discourse and need to be included. Um, this is maybe also one of the reasons several people have mentioned the initiative for RECOM and the eventual um, failure of that recognition. What I would say about the failure of RECOM is that everything that RECOM did not fail at 
it's succeeded at. That is to say, um, right, the largest failure is that the commission was not established. Um, and uh, this is something I mean, many of the people in this panel um, were active, some more than others, in trying to, uh, to get it established. But if you look at the consultations that took place during the process in which there was a campaign to establish it, what RECOM demonstrated um, is the degree to which dialogue and mutual recognition and mutual respect can be, uh, um, can be developed through goodwill between people with radically different types of experience of, um, of the violence of the 1990s. Um, this includes victims coming from, uh, from different groups. It includes veterans. Um, it includes representatives of, uh, um, of different parts of, uh, of, of the society. So, I mean, I think we engage institutions, we engage social groups. There is a possibility to, uh, um, to move forward. I think that also when we talk about failure, um, we might need to interrogate what is being postulated as a measure of success. Um, the formula of transitional justice is that truth leads to justice, which leads to a kind of catharsis and, uh, um, and change. This is a bit mechanistic. It's a bit formulaic. What's behind it is an assumption is that political and social processes are going to follow a path that reflects the progress of legal processes, um, and they have not. But this does not mean that things are not happening. And there has been a very interesting generation of recent research, especially by people involved in anthropology and ethnography, on ways in which people remember and make sense of the recent past. And here I'm talking about researchers like Jelena Obradovic, like Azra Kromadzic, like uh, Steph Janssen. Um, who talk about the complex ways in which people remember and integrate understanding and a desire for mutual recognition with their memories as they are, uh, um, as they are developing. So we need to respect the diversities of, uh, of ways in which memories develop. And then we turn to the basic question um, that Dayan posed about states. Well, what can states do? I mean, I can give you first a relatively formal answer, and that is to say states can meet their obligations. Um, and states have at least three types of obligations. They have obligations to one another, um, and this is where we talk about concrete initiatives like identification of, uh, um, of missing persons and so on. They have obligations on the level of law and value, um, that is an interest in justice that they ought to pursue. And they have an obligation to citizens to satisfy citizens' rights, especially rights to knowledge and truth, something where the obligations of states could be realized much better on the level of education. But basically, I would step back and uh, look at the context slightly more widely um, and say that the most important thing that states can do is turn away from representations of collectives, turn away from the questions of which national or ethnic group is most guilty or most victimized or most noble or least noble or however we want to put it, um, and turn to instead toward the experience of survivors and victims to approach these people as people with needs that require being met and to recognize that very often these needs are not symbolic needs. They are not only symbolic needs. They are not only needs for recognition and respect for experience, but in many instances, they are also material needs, material needs that can be addressed by material means, by addressing people's needs for housing, for income, um, for, uh, um, for medical care, and so on. Um, that is to say that the main suggestion that I would make to states since I spend most of my time not answering the question you asked, um, is to try to repair some of the damage that they have done. Th thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Eric. <laughs> okay, uh, we have about an hour for um, discussion now, and here it comes our big surprise. We've uh, actually asked um, two students so members of new generation, one domestic and one international, both uh, now taking the course in politics and society in Southeast Europe at the Faculty of Political Science, to um, 
maybe be the first discussants here um, and to tell us what for their generation, which, is, which includes people born after the war and after the 1990s, um, the war means in this conflict, is, it, is this still a part of their agenda or maybe not? Do they feel that they are overburdened with the folks of the 1990s and about the past? And secondly, um, is there any recommendation they would try to um, present so that their, their generation is not facing the same issues and the same kind of problems in answering them as the generation that experienced the war, unfortunately and sadly, from, from their own personal experience. So, um, I mean, I've seen uh, at least one of these students here. This is Viktor Kirkletz. Viktor, where are you? There you are. Okay. Um, now, the microphone is yours, and we, are, we will be very happy to, to hear your views. Thank you. Um, esteemed professors, uh, esteemed ambassadors, distinguished guests, and dear colleagues and friends from the Faculty of Political Science, my name is Viktor Kirkletz, and I'm a fourth-year uh, student of political science here in Zagreb. Uh, first of all, I would, in my own name and in the name of my colleagues, like to give our warmest thanks to Professor Jovic for uh, asking us to attend and even participate uh, in this debate. Which brings me to my first point in my uh, short speech. That is that young people in the Balkans, from my perspective at least, often do not have the chance to participate in such events and make their voices heard when it comes to uh, dealing with the past and the experiences of the 1990s. Naturally, we as the post-war generation, we are not policy experts, but I do believe that uh, there could be some useful pieces of advice given by us to the uh, people making important decisions about these matters. And even when young people here are given the chance to participate and to make their voices heard, they are unfortunately often uninterested or apathetic towards the entire situation, which is a part of the larger problem of the lack of political participation uh, among youth uh, in, in these parts. Now, the topic of uh, reconciliation and normalization of relations between uh, ex Yugoslav countries is not a topic which is on everyone's mind as a student. Students have, uh, especially students who are not in the realm of humanities or political science, students have their own issues and are not burdened uh, as much by these uh, serious topics. But that does not mean that these topics are any less important because for my generation, the shadow of the past still hangs over us. And if those issues are not resolved, one day we will have to be the ones uh, trying to find the best solution uh, to the entire situation. Uh, as to the question of finally coming to terms with our past, it is naturally uh, a very difficult question. I mean, we have been at it for 30 years and still there has been some progress, but we're still far from uh, finally settling things once and for all. Yet it is a question which has to be answered if we are ever to have uh, lasting peace here in the uh, Western Balkans. Unfortunately, young people, even though some are interested, do not have the means to influence uh, events and that is why uh, most of the work and the heavy lifting has to be taken over by people currently in power. The best we as the next generation in my opinion can do is to privately foster normalization of relations so to speak through contacts with youth in uh, other uh, former Yugoslav countries or through participation in various organizations of the civil society or NGOs, for example. One such example is the European Youth Parliament, which I was a member of for many years and which has really broadened my horizons as it brought together people from all over Europe and all the uh, former participants in the conflict uh, back in the 1990s. However, that there is only so much that can be done by the youth in this 
private sphere of improving interpersonal relations. And if we're ever to have a firm foundation to build good relations, the major questions still have to be resolved. The questions that have been mentioned already, the question of war crimes, the question of displaced persons, missing persons, no matter the participant, uh, the, the perpetrator, uh, those questions have to be resolved because from the experience of the 1990s, we've seen what can happen when such difficult questions are metaphorically put under the rug and repressed for 50 or 60 or more years. And we have seen what can happen when those questions once again come to surface. As President Josipovic mentioned, we've seen neighbor go against neighbor, whole families and whole communities torn apart. And uh, if I may paraphrase Professor uh, Jovic, who has mentioned in his lecture several times that most ideologies do not die, they hibernate. And when the conditions are right, those ideologies can come back to life and haunt us once again. And that is why I believe that much more needs to be done in order to put these questions to rest finally so that the most extreme forms of violent ideologies that have come back to life in the 90s can finally die off. Thank you. Thanks so much, Victor. And uh, now we'll hear from an Italian student who came here to, for Erasmus, Angela Perisinato. Angela there, yeah, please make microphone to Angela. And then we'll open the floor for a general debate. As I'm sure we're all waiting for it, yes, Angela. Okay, so good morning to everyone. Thank you for all your speeches. I'm very glad to be here and listen to you today. Uh, as the professor said before, I am Angela Perissinotto from Italy, from the University of Bologna, but I'm currently an exchange student here at the University of Zagreb. Okay, so maybe for me to answer to these questions is difficult because I wasn't even born uh, during the war, for, so I'm from a different generation and from another country, from Italy. But... Um, from my previous experiences uh, in high school, I had the opportunity, thanks to uh, NGOs, to come here and in other countries and to learn what happened here in the past, and also to visit museums, to visit some places, and to learn more, let's say. So, um, from my point of view, uh, like the legacy, is very important. When you think about dealing uh, with the past, you have to think about justice, you have to think about memory, remembrance. And uh, for me, uh, for young students, it's very important to uh, learn at school uh, through history classes. So, like, um, the issue about curricula, it's very important for me, not only for students that are living and studying here, but also for students coming from other countries. They have to know what happened here. And, of course, apart from school, for me, uh, it's important to think about civil society, about NGOs. For me, it's very important the students uh, knows the activity held by uh, NGOs. Maybe uh, it's important to, uh, for them to have the chance to participate in their work, maybe through uh, projects or internships, also by the European Union, in order to foster their knowledge about what happened and also to do something um, nowadays. And um, that's um, mainly um, all because I think that really um, NGOs are um, the association that are working on the field. So they have databases, they have the knowledge to inspire people and let us understand um, the main points. And like, I think that for me was very important in the past to understand what's going on in the past and I hope that also other students in the future will have the opportunity to do that. 
Good, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm, I'm sure there are uh, uh, comments and questions from, from the audience uh, to what we have heard in all this uh, uh, very, I think, challenging and useful uh, introductory remarks. So I see already uh, Vesna Pusic, uh, Mrs. Pusic, uh, could you just, yeah, Vesna. Thank you very much, and thank you for your presentations. It was really interesting and, and sort of made me think about so many things, but I will restrict myself to three points. <laughs> uh, one has to do with ICTY. The other um, has to do with, I think, of, uh, the other has to do with um, uh, the missing persons and the role of the missing persons in today's politics, that is an issue. And the third has to do with, I think, a very interesting point that Ergordi made about the institutions that societies have, tr that societies trust. Uh, this has been a very confusing issue for our societies because this is true. Societies actually trust in all the you know, sociological research, they trust at the top of the list are the church and the military. And the church and the military were actually, uh, to a large extent, responsible for uh, uh, stoking the conflict. And so this was extremely confusing for all of the societies in the region, but I will come to that. I want to say a few words in, in defense of the ICTY and the tribunal. Uh, it wasn't ideal, it, you know, you, we can criticize it on, on many different levels, but I would say you cannot expect an institution like that to rectify everything that was done by a series of wars over 10 years from Slovenia to Kosovo. Uh, but it performed an extremely important role. As, and I think one thing we have to learn from it, that institutions like that are and always will be imperfect. The question is, what's the, you know, at the end of the day, whether it's more pluses than minuses. And I think that, that ICTY definitely had more pluses, as, as Iwasipovic also said. Um, but I remember from first-hand experience, um, our prime minister, uh, the first non-HDZ prime minister in 2000, was before ICTY actually you know, reached any important uh, decisions. He was scared to hand in the... Uh, um, invitation from ICTY to a uh, Croatian general to appear before the court because he didn't know how to deal with that. And this had an enormous influence. The, the workings of the ICTY later on, um, for instance, one thing that it contributed as far as Croatia is concerned, the fact that the government was after, let's say, 2001, 2003, 2004, wasn't afraid of its own military anymore. Before that, it was afraid of its own military. I remember this was one example. The other example is the famous letter of nine wartime generals, which our former President Mesic then retired in one day with a stroke of the pen. This was unthinkable before that. So there are many things, you know, we forget how it felt at that time, but if you, you sort of made me think about that and realize that uh, the difference bet between what was before and what, how that changed after the work that you know, uh, the tribunal was, was doing had some effect uh, is huge. And it's very important. And I think that uh, this also should be seen as 
the limits of what an institution in those circumstances, what an institution like this could do. Because you know, there is also with time it get politicized, all kinds of things uh, happen. This, this I think is, is almost inevitable, but it did perform its function. And if you think of, you know, um, I don't know, Zoran Džinjic and Ceda Jovanović, Ceda Jovanović of those years, not Ceda Jovanović of today, but of those years, uh, it would have been impossible. They wouldn't have been able to breathe, let alone do anything in Serbia without having some place to send Milosevic. And uh, the same thing here. Uh, if you had to process people who were suspected and later convicted of war crimes in Croatia, it would have created extreme conflict within the uh, very fragile society at that time. And just the fact that you could export these guys to The Hague, I think had an important, at the time, had an important effect. The other point is, is um, missing persons. I think that's an important thing and it should be dealt with, but unfortunately it has been transformed into a code word for not doing anything. Because you are not improving relations be until the missing persons are not found. Now, if you want to make progress on missing persons, also from personal experience, you do it out of the public site. You don't do it on center stage. There are diplomatic ways of going about it and actually making progress. When you do it center stage, it means we are not moving anywhere. And finally, I already made my points about the church and the, and the, the military. I mean, they, it's extremely confusing for a society when the two institutions that they traditionally have the most confidence in, I would translate that into that they see as the stabilizing institutions, become the instigators of the war or the, the uh, you know, creators in many ways of hate speech and all kinds of, that is very damaging and it takes a long time to, to repair. So thank you again. Thank you. Um, let me just see how many questions we may expect. If we could just get one, two, yes, three. Uh, then perhaps if we, yeah, I see, I see three. Right, more? Uh -huh, okay. Um, so uh, maybe we can just collect a little bit more, a few more questions, and then uh, if you wish to address uh, some of these issues uh, later on, yeah. Um, shall we start with you, Ambassador Sacco? Good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for having uh, organized this, uh, uh, dear friends. It's really very illustrative, uh, very, very interesting, and also a further demonstration of maturity that is being acquired by Foreign Policy Forum. Much welcome development on the Croatian public uh, stage. Uh, um, my comment is out of personal uh, belief it turns into a question to the panelists uh, and um, links to the two uh, uh, young students, the two students' interventions. Can uh, Europe, can Europe be the pathway to true reconciliation? Can Europe, in terms of European project, European values, discussion about how we can improve Europe uh, uh, become the real pathway uh, um, in, in terms of uh, seeing, looking for similarities, looking for proximity, looking for ways in which we can digitalize our economies, uh, green our economies, make more inclusive and more just our societies, picking up also on how important is housing, social uh, welfare, to have uh, uh, people who suffered experience a sense, personal sense of reconciliation. From the 22nd to the 26th of November, Rome, Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs will host something which is titled EU Balkans Youth Forum. 
and this will uh, then uh, merge into the discussions on the conference on the future of Europe. A Croatian commissioner uh, recently, a Croatian commissioner, uh, Suiza, uh, recently said that she would like to see Croatian uh, uh, public opinion much more involved or something like that in the discussions on the, on the future of Europe. So can a voice to the youth in, in terms of how can we shape a Europe for the future, how they feel about you, can be the pathway to true reconciliation in this region. Thank you. Uh, thank you. The next one is uh, Ms. Kai, Ambassador of Japan. Thank, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, many of our colleague ambassadors who are present here have actually worked at the UN and we are happily surprised to see, run into each other again in Zagreb. So uh, I think they know what I'm talking about, but uh, having worked in the UN, IT, ITCY and ITCR were the real star instruments in, in those days. And uh, why? Because uh, it's not only funded and assessed by the entire international community, but also, uh, for instance, from 2001 to 4, one Japanese judge worked as a judge at ITCY, so it has uh, some sort of uh, what you call a universality. And uh, from universality uh, becomes, I think, legitimacy. And uh, as Professor Yasna said, yes, uh, our, we have been apologizing <laughs> our prime minister in the 70th anniversary of the Second World War in uh, 2015. In his statement, he said he deeply bows and shows condolence to the victims. And so uh, this Yugoslav war is not our war, it's your war, but it's our war. Because uh, the issue about, okay, you are 25 years after the war, we are 75 years after the war, but the past still comes and haunts us. So this is a universal problem. And uh, so what I observe is that, uh, as uh, Minister Vesna said, it had worked. It had worked because it had the legitimacy. And also, I suspect that it worked uh, because it, uh, it was already uh, declared to be created in 1993. That's still two years before the your homeland war finished. So it sort of motivated the people that it's going to be treated someday in a legal justice way. I, I think that's one worked as a motivation in how the war was ended. And also because uh, it motivated uh, Croatia to, uh, because joining the EU, you have to have uh, sort of legal handling and that can be uh, recognized by not any old uh, institution, but the universal institution. So I think it also motivated you uh, to uh, rectify yourself and join the EU. So this um, motivation effect was also uh, uh, very valuable about uh, IT ITCY. Uh, so so my, my question is uh, maybe uh, at this stage, uh, somehow uh, I think uh, international community is still watching how you are going to uh, gradually, um, of course it's closed, but there is a, uh, another residual organization, but how you are actually going to uh, close yourself and come to terms with the new uh, phase of history where young people are more um, trying to, uh, not to forget, but forgive and then uh, look towards the future rather than trying to always evoke the past. So I, I wonder if the distinguished panelists may have some views or comments on this aspect. Thank you. Thank you so much. We also have a question from Canadian Ambassador, Mr. Alan Bowman, please. Thank you very much. Thank you to the uh, Foreign Policy Forum for the uh, very, uh, like this I think is the best panel I've, I've, I've heard on any subject since I've arrived in Croatia. So to thank you very much, uh, live or Zoom or any, like it, it uh, thank you. And thank you for the uh, foreign, uh, the outside guests for, for enriching the discussion. But my favorite presentation, uh, although uh, as usual, w w was from uh, Vesna Tasheric. Uh, I think you, you, you've really uh, uh, provided 
extremely important uh, reflections and, and good advice for, for, for all of us. Um, in our uh, experience in Canada, we, we're, we're dealing with reconciliation on a completely different issue, but it's with our First Nations. Um, and it, it's been a very difficult path. Um, and uh, I just want to make two points uh, that reinforce hopefully some of what was said today, is acknowledgement is, is critical. You have to, you have to, uh, and the highest political levels, and gestures, uh, symbolic gestures are important, um, and, and they can be meaningful. Um, uh, so so this, our experience demonstrates that clearly, I think. Um, but to go back to what uh, Professor Gordy was saying, um, uh, improving the material um, uh, conditions of, of people affected um, is, is also critical. You, you have to be, to do something, you, you have to go beyond symbolic gestures. And I think if you don't, you can't go wrong by trying to improve the material conditions of, 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 of victims and survivors. Uh, so, uh, so, so, so you, you have to do, to do both. And, uh, and I do think that, uh, I, I don't know, I, I'm, uh, I don't want to appear to be uh, supporting any uh, particular partisan uh, option in Croatian politics, but I see Deputy Prime Minister Milosevic these days uh, spending a lot of time improving the material conditions or trying to of people affected by the earthquake who, 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 uh, uh, so, so, uh, who happen to be from minorities, um, uh, so, so uh, there, are, there, are, there are good things that are being done in Croatia uh, at this time that I would like to applaud. So, so uh, many of you have said that more needs to be done, but, but there are things that are, that are being done here that, that are worthy of uh, our support. Uh, uh, my question, though, if, if I can, my ask one is, like, complexity is, is, is very complex, you know, uh, so, uh, and it's very difficult in a, a world of sound bites, tweets, and, and, and having uh, young people, and actually the young people here might have better answers to that question than the panel, but how do we convey complexity about the war um, to, to people in primary school? You know, uh, it, it's, uh, I've seen some of how it's taught here, and it, it's not taught in a very complex way, it, it's taught in a very simple way. So where do you start? Like, uh, how do you convey complexity to, to young people? Um, and how do you change the narrative and explain that this is much more complex than, than people understand, where people are looking for simple answers? Um, so uh, 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 I guess a key question about public policy generally in all kinds of areas, but in this particular area, I, I just don't know where to start, you know, in explaining it to my own daughter, you know, so, uh, so please help. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. And if you could just uh, pass the microphone to the next person to you, um, the Ambassador of Norway, Hakan Blankenberg. Mr. Blankenberg, Thank please. Thank you so much. And uh, there are so many aspects uh, I would like to hear more comments on, and I will try to limit myself, uh, probably unsuccessful, uh, successfully, but still. Um, first, um, there are, we're talking about reconciliation or reconciliation, yeah, um, at least two dimensions. There's one internal in the countries and between countries. And um, they're heavily interlinked as uh, no state would give up their engagement on, so to say, internal affairs in neighboring states. So my, I would put it rather simply, say, uh, what comes first? Uh, it's easy to say that uh, it has to go in parallel, uh, but that's, uh, that, that's a bit uh, complicated. And um, uh, President Josipovic made me change my mind on political symbols, and I mentioned it to, to others here as well. Um, with his uh, walk in Belgrade together with uh, Mr. Tadic, uh, which the, the effect of that symbol was so immense in, uh, in Serbia and the follow-up also in neighboring countries. So of course, political symbols, if I could call it a symbol, uh, it has a huge effect, but then comes the follow-up. So that's the two elements, uh, the internal reconciliation and the effect cross-border what to come first, and it's about state, uh, and it's about civil society as well. And the third one is um, the complexity when we are talking about the so-called Western Balkans, as it's one uh, topic, but it's, it's quite different if we take uh, the six 
and we have seen that uh, uh, when we have we are talking about uh, the six, suddenly there are some, should we say, historical skeletons in some cupboards uh, coming from even uh, neighboring states beyond the, uh, that region. Uh, so, is there a Gorik not, so to say, when we are talking about the, the so-called Western Balkans? Uh, it's uh, so fragmented, not so different, so can we talk about uh, uh, reconciliation, cooperation on the Western Balkans, or uh, should we fragment it, or should it be uh, more on a state level? Of course, uh, at, academically we can talk about it more in, in principles, a reconciliation, but when it comes to practice, can we talk about Western Balkans as one topic? Thank you. Thank you so much. We have two more uh, questions and comments before we give the floor to, for the final round of positions. Yes, poll stops. Uh, the microphone over there, please. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for a great panel. I'm, I'm not yet an ambassador, but there's still time. Um, uh, I wanted to pick up on something that President Josipovic said, and I apologize in advance because it was a very small part of what you said, and I may have misheard it, but it's the, the criticism you made of the concepts of the joint criminal enterprise in the ICTY, and you argued that it was problematic, not least because there is no equivalent in law elsewhere. And I was trying to, you know, and I'm a sociologist, not a lawyer, right? So this is not, this is shaky terrain that I'm on. And I was thinking that maybe conspiracy to commit criminal acts is a kind of similar thing, but there are real problems even with that. And you're already shaking your head, but that, that's not the main point. The, the main question then is, are you here arguing that the joint criminal enterprise idea is a is a problem because it mixes politics with legality? Or is there a way so that actually the connections between individual criminal acts and political direction should be a subject of political struggle? Or do you think it could be better formulated and could actually be part of a legal process? Thank you. Thank you. Uh I haven't actually seen, but I've been told that actually the person next to you wants also to, to ask a question. Is that? Maybe. No? No? Okay. But we have one uh, from this side of the audience, please. The uh, lady in the third row. Yes. Um, my first question was for Professor Soso, but she just left the room. So I'll first start with the uh, she'll, she'll come back. We will repeat that to you. To okay. Her. Um, I would like to ask um, Professor Gordy to perhaps share his opinion on intergenerational trauma uh, from the events of the 1990s in societies of this region, because um, the burden that a lot of like young people have had to inherit as a result of the experiences of our parents and our grandparents and the events they participated in and they witnessed, um, I think my question is actually like what um, actor or institution should perhaps take on the challenge of tackling this issue in order to prevent the experiences of, of the past further um, defining the relations between states in the region and amongst future leaders that are going to come from these societies. And uh, for Professor Soso, she touched upon the lacking element of acknowledgement in achieving reconciliation, and I wanted to ask for her opinion in the case of the Western Balkans, what form of acknowledgement would she find to be most beneficial um, to achieve prosperity and um, long-lasting peace in the region, and would that be in the form of uh, public apologies, like uh, in the case of the presidency of Ivo Josipovic, or would she just suggest a different route? And what is actually uh, achievable based on current political events in the region? Thank you. Thank you so much. I think by this we actually complete the questions session, right? And now we actually go to the final uh, round of uh, interventions by, by our panelists. Um, I don't know, maybe Eric, you can, because some of the questions, and including this, this last one, has been directed to you directly. Maybe if you could just okay. say something about that. Yes, uh, um, thanks very much. And, and let me just say, I think this is the first time that I've appeared at a panel. Thanks so much for these, these questions and comments. And immediately get responses from a former foreign minister 
the ambassadors of four countries and, and also the ambassador from Liverpool. Um, this, is, uh, this is really um, a, a rare occasion and, uh, and privilege for people in, uh, um, in our field. Um, I can't answer all of these, but, uh, but I'll try to answer some. I mean, first I would like to thank uh, uh, the ambassador from Canada for raising um, the experience of Canada. And I just want to underline um, the Canadian Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, perhaps did not get as much international attention as, uh, as it could have, um, but it produced, I mean, it did excellent work. Um, and produced especially, I would highlight its document from 2015 on 10 principles of reconciliation um, that sets out principles that are easily translatable to a very, very large number of, uh, um, of situations across the world. I think it's, a, uh, um, it's an important foundational document. Um, to, uh, um, to the question about generational trauma, um, I think we, yeah, we know about generational trauma, and there are people who have, uh, um, who have talked about uh, ways in which violence in one generation can be accounted for by the failures uh, to address um, the experience of violence in previous generations. I think this is especially the case um, for people who, uh, um, who explain some of the intensity of violence that occurred during um, the wars of succession in the former Yugoslavia in the 1990s to questions that were unresolved or, uh, um, or kept quiet um, after, after the end of, of the Second World War. Um, and here, um, I, I think the basic insight is, is so simple that the answer is going to disappoint you. Um, but um, that I think that the, um, the best thing that can really be done is to tell young people the truth. This is, this is what they want to know. Um, they want to know about what the experience was, what it was like, and also what it was like for other people. You know, one of, uh, one of the things that we have capacity for as humans um, is to recognize the qualities in other humans that make them human. And this is something we tend to overlook. Um, and uh, all of these other points and questions are certainly very interesting. Maybe I'll confine myself to just saying something yeah. about religion. Y yes, and, and, and so, yeah, the question on what we can actually do when the two most trusted institutions play destructive rather than constructive role. I mean, that was, I think, Vesna's yes. uh, point, right? Yes, uh, um, I mean, the question of what you can do with, about it, I think that, uh, um, the people in this room with more experience than me might confirm there's not much that you can do about it. Um, but, uh, um, but I think religion um, is, uh, is an especially difficult uh, institution and, uh, and that all of us who are religious have, uh, um, have felt this conflict within religious institutions over orientation to other institutions. Um, the principles of um, religion or um, or from my own religious experience that I would bring forward would perhaps be best summarized in um, two Bible quotations, excuse me, the first from Amos chapter five, verse 24, let, uh, um, let justice flow like a river and righteousness like a mighty stream. Um, and the second from Matthew chapter 22, verse 21, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar and render unto God that which is God's. Um, these uh, are principles that ought to go together. The reason that they do not go together is that the structure of religious life takes on under conditions of political constraint, the structure of political life and religious institutions act as institutions responding to constituencies um, leading to this sort of polarization. Um, and I understand that, uh, um, that the question that you posed is about how this, uh, this problem can be, can be solved. Um, this is a question to which I would like very much to have an answer, but, but I think I do not. Thank you so much. I think one direct question really was addressed basically to you, Professor Yosipovic, and this was about a joint criminal enterprise by, by Paul Stubbs, and if you could just clarify a little bit more um, on your position. And then after that, there was also this question that is more general um, on the, um, 
on uh, Europe and uh, the role of Europe in all this uh, process, which actually I'd leave then to others as well. But I mean, this first okay, so, uh, definitely any politics can be criminal as well. So it's not a matter of politics, it's a matter of criminal law. I'm professor of criminal law. So I'm now going to speak as a professor of criminal law, not as a politician. Because if someone is promoting genocide, it's criminal, in spite it's part of politics. But what constitutes the crime? The crime constitutes someone's act against the law with intent or negligence. So there must be a connection between person, act, uh, and uh, knowledge. That means that uh, someone who is not connected uh, with the act, with the criminal act, cannot be guilty. So there are three forms of joint criminal enterprise. One of this is some kind of conspiracy. It's okay, no one against it. Second, as well, in the practice of the ICTY, it was practiced all both of these two two uh, forms of joint criminal enterprise, and probably it's not necessary to explain details. We are not at the university. So, but the third one, in the third one, there is no connection because the accused person didn't do anything that's described as a criminal activity, and even that person didn't know, didn't have any uh, intellectual con uh, connection with the crime. So at least two elements of the criminal responsibility is missing. And that is the problem of this third form of criminal enterprise. And uh, as I told you, there is no criminal law, no criminal legislation having this type of criminal responsibility in the whole world. Secondly, this type of criminal uh, responsibility is not envisaged in the statute of the ICTY. It's invented during, after several years of, of court practice. That's the second problem. Third problem, after the court practice, the case law of the ICTY, this type of joint criminal enterprise was not involved in the statute of the ICC. Why? Because no example for it. And definitely, especially people knowing something about the law are not satisfied with this type. And in my perception, this type of criminal responsibility, this false type, is involved because of weaknesses of investigation. And that was somehow some backdoor for the prosecutor how to, uh, how to put the case to the end. Thank you. Um, we have a question, just to remind you, to, to uh, Vesna Tercelic, and that is about the complexity and how complex is the complexity, and you know, how can we convey complexity to uh, young pupils in schools, and is there any recommendation we can make about that? And this was related, obviously, to the question of the new phase of peacemaking, the one that the uh, Madam Ambassador um, asked as well. If you could just offer some insights or views. Thank you, thank you for questions. Uh, and uh, I would say, uh, first of all, it's important to keep underlying importance of engaging with past. And this is somehow contra, you know, what most humans hope for especially politicians, scientists, want to have it finished, want to have these legacy issues done with. So, uh, of course, that, you know, there is this intention of uh, let's deal with past, but until the certain moment. So when is this moment? So there is this, you know, question in the room. When will finally can say this is over? And when you analyze political speeches, you will actually quite frequently uh, encounter that uh, there is this expectation, uh, we are doing it, and okay, we'll focus on it, uh, but uh, it should be finished as soon as possible. Well, my experience is this is not going to happen. This is very bad news. Uh, so it's that the answer is to engage with past. 
to engage with past, that's especially important in education. Because, you know, one thing which can be shared with uh, people of younger generation is, well, it's the bad news, so it's not going to leave. <laughs> and uh, eventually, when you engage with it in creative, educational ways, this becomes kind of ongoing acknowledgement. And uh, I would just give some examples. Uh, as Documenta, we are deeply involved in Erasmus programs. Uh, Erasmus Youth Exchange being one of the best legacies of European Union. You know, wherever you look, I mean, I guess Erasmus has something to do with <laughs> Uh, with presence uh, of students uh, from different countries in Croatia and this kind of allowing students to study in other countries, but also allowing exchange of non-formal uh, education uh, tools, uh, but also simply, you know, allowing young people to meet and discuss things and do things together. It's fantastic. But many of these exchanges do not go after controversial topics. Of course, that for Documenta, we are mostly in the ones which deal straight with controversial topics. And I'm happy to tell you that young people are very keen and very creative in dealing with controversial topics. You know, currently we have a program with title dealing with popular myths. They're happy to, you know, go in and find new ways how to get out of that. They also have expectations we'll get out of that. I mean, you know, popular myths, I don't think so I'll see in my life that will come on the end of this valley. But uh, it's important to deal with it. Uh, so it's that uh, it's simply a matter of developing new de deductive tools, new campaigns, new discussions, new formats, uh, you know, either on university, for, for the age, I have to say, looking at uh, the experience which we have, normally it doesn't start before the age of, uh, let's say, 13. So this is in Croatia, 7th uh, and 8th grade of elementary school. Uh, although uh, the crucial age is actually to tell you what research is showing between uh, 13 and 18. So university is too late. <laughs> this is another bad news. <laughs> uh, and there are not so many actors who would go for controversial topics earlier than on university. Because on university, people got already so specialized and some value, uh, uh, value connected issues have already been resolved by uh, the, the students. So it's, uh, this, this is a golden time. And in particular, research related to Holocaust education have shown that. So there are really valid research results telling us focus on high classes of primary school and secondary school. This is the most important. But it's not just about youngsters, of course. I'm not trying to, to put a burden on youngsters uh, because it's really intergenerational and each generation has responsibility and the ways to engage or choose not to engage, which is much more often the case. So I would just mention another example of uh, brilliant work of Center for Nonviolent Action from Sarajevo and Belgrade, who actually work with veterans of war in a very demanding long-term process in which veterans uh, learn about crimes committed by their guys and find the ways to commemorate with other veterans and survivors a crimes committed uh, by their uh, colleagues. So it's uh, that they work on it now more than 10 years. I think results are very rewarding, especially in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And you know, you might see uh, a veterans as a group which would be less likely to contribute. I think they give spectacularly important contribution. So it's that, you know, uh, not to say, okay, I'll tell also that, the church leaders of, uh, you know, some representatives of Catholic Church and Orthodox Church lately have made some important steps. Uh, and it's, it's not to be 
you know, qualified as non-important. Because, of course, if you look what was their contribution in preparation of war, this would look like less spectacular. But, you know, let's just let them go in that direction. Let's hope that more, more bishops and more episcops will go in that direction. Uh, it's all imperfect, but it's actually reconciliation demands contribution practically of everyone, in particular of every institution, either university or government or embassy or, you know, it's, it's really, uh, it really remar uh, needs request, uh, responses of all of us. Thank you, Vesna. No, I think this, at least to a degree, uh, also corresponds to some of other questions, such as the role of the European Union in, in all this. Uh, and the, uh, I'm glad to see uh, a youth initiative, human rights, uh, youth initiative for human rights representatives here, also in the audience. And so, but maybe, uh, I mean, now we have uh, all remaining questions for, for Jasna here, <laughs> but not, not least important. Um, one of them was actually, uh, the question was uh, put uh, forward while you were not here. And uh, so therefore the question, if I understand it well, was about what form of acknowledgement would be best, right? Uh, in when, when we are dealing with, with the past. And then there was, uh, from Norwegian ambassador, the effect of symbolism and what is the follow-up of that, really, and, and whether we can, we should treat the Western Balkans as one uh, unit or whether we should approach uh, some of these uh, countries or all of them um, differently. And, and uh, just to remind you also of this importance of the acknowledgement and, and of the material also conditions. Uh, this, is, this is something that, that uh, Eric mentioned. Okay, if there is anything else, but don't forget the European Union, that is, it seems to be important uh, uh, to all of us. Uh, yeah. Yes. I will solve all your problems in two minutes. <laughs> um, no, okay. Yeah, that's a lot of topics and a lot of issues, and I'm just going to highlight a few things that I think um, need to be highlighted. And actually, first of all, I would like to raise one more thing in addition to uh, what uh, Vesna Pusic mentioned, which is the institutions that people have trust in. I mean, one thing that we haven't mentioned here, which has been um, very important um, by all means, is uh, the institution of the family. And the, the, the fact that people will receive knowledge from family members and from, you know, close friends and, and, and groups in, to which they belong, informal groups. And this has been the subject of some study as well. Um, I'm thinking here of um, Sinisha Malesevic, for example, who has um, worked on, on, you know, on these kinship ties at the micro level and to what extent they then influence understandings of the war. And um, so that's something that I would just add into the fray. Uh, that it's these levels of interaction that are really very, very important, even when we think about the big picture of, you know, reconciliation and the role of political authorities and so on. And as we know, I think, from the previous experiences, both in this region and elsewhere, um, you know, th this sort of privately held memory or transgenerational memory is probably the most important form of memory. And uh, you know, finding ways of um, articulating public memory that will both resonate with those experiences, but also put them into a broader context. In other words, if you are being told about the suffering and the, and the um, terrible experiences within your own village or your own family, to understand that yes, these should be validated, these are real experiences, but that they have taken place in a wider context where you know others have experienced perhaps similar things and so how to convey that message through education through churches um, through educational institutions through you know political discourse is i think the important thing um, the eu i mean there's a lot that could be said about the eu some of it has already been said um, I think the EU has done some brilliant work on the, on the micro level in terms of supporting many of the projects that have uh, led to knowledge production about the wars in the region and that have also helped, you know, rebuilding, um, you know, at a, at a basic level, material conditions and so on. So I think that needs to be said and it's very important um, and support for groups that are engaged in this work is really important too. 
On the macro level, of course, when you have a whole bunch of countries that have been now waiting for two decades or more to try and come into the EU and keeping them on the threshold and inventing you know, new conditions. I mean, I'm, I've just been reading about Bulgaria's conditions um, for North Macedonia. Uh, obviously, this is what's going to make the headlines. And unfortunately, um, you know, I come from a country which um, has just left the EU, and I think the problem is that all the valuable work that was done in that country on the micro level, um, you know, has gotten completely sidelined and lost um, because the focus has been so much on macro level uh, issues and, and misrepresentation of some of those issues. Uh, but that's a different debate. Um, uh, so that's what I would have to say about the uh, EU. Um, now, in terms of the um, questions from the ambassador of Norway, which I thought were really, really interesting. Um, and, you know, this is something that I've actually been thinking about because I work on truth commissions and the attempts to create truth commissions and where have they been created, where were they relatively successful and where did they not work or were not created. And, um, and I've been looking at some of these supposed success stories, such as, for example, the Chilean Truth and Reconciliation Commission, or the South African one. And there, the notion of national reconciliation was actually really, really fundamental. And to come back to you know, my initial point about you know, what kind of future is being envisaged by policy makers and people involved in these projects, well, clearly there was in those cases, a national project, um, a project where, you know, because of the nature of the transition, there was a threat of violence, a threat of, you know, whether it be a military coup or whether it be a, you know, a civil war in, in South Africa, for example. And so an attempt was made to envisage a, a future in which you could actually overcome those differences, at least on the level of preventing violence. And that was a very important aspect. So the whole discourse around these institutions had to do with nation building within, um, within those countries that would kind of bridge over the divisions and bridge over um, the differences, um, political or, or racial in the case of, um, of South Africa. And of course, these were only partially successful experiments and they have been very criticized afterwards. But I think in that moment, this discourse, as you have of you know, the rainbow nation of being inclusive, uh, was absolutely crucial. And providing victim testimony from different sides of the divide was absolutely crucial. Creating empathy um, uh, across the divides was, was very, very important. Now, it, this doesn't mean that this na necessarily has to happen at the national level. I mean, it can happen at a different level. It could happen at, at the regional level. But I think, so there's no sort of sequence of how these things should go. However, I think the more, the easier, I suppose, on approach is to do it perhaps on the national level initially in the first phase, or at least to, you know, try to um, uh, address um, the states that we have in the region at the moment and engage them in you know, doing this at their own national level and then perhaps also at the international level because of course we, have, we, st we still do not have ethnically clean states in the region by any means even though you know, there has been a process of ethnic uh, uh, cleansing and untanglement uh, I mean, these are still multinational states to a large degree. So by addressing these national issues, you are automatically also then addressing empathy towards those um, groups in, in other parts of the region. Um, uh, yes, so symbols and apologies. I'm sorry I missed your question, but I, I've been told what it is. Um, symbols and apologies, yes, are very important at a moment, but they're they do not exist if we're going to have a sort of a transformational effect. They cannot exist in a vacuum. They have to be part of something that comes before and something that comes after. And that's why, for example, some of the more important, I think, apologies come after the process of, for example, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, as in, in Canada. I mean, apologies have meaning when 
the actual crimes and the actual violations are set out and we know what we're apologizing for. Um, they also need to be followed up by policy afterwards. It's not enough to just issue an apology at a particular moment. There has to be a policy after that that will then act to protect those minorities, to compensate them, to, to do something of a reparation uh, in, in terms of a reparation for the wrongs caused. And this, of course, has been one of the main stumbling blocks for apologies. You know, political leaders do not want to apologize because they do not want to pay reparations. So, you know, this is something that needs to be thought through carefully because apologies that are issued without some sort of follow-up are usually short-lived and do not have a longer-term impact of any kind. And this then brings me to the last point about material conditions. And here again, I would like to just go back to the German case, which has been such a, you know, seminal case. And of course, I mean, as, as many scholars have noted, I mean, Germany's coming to terms with the past took place in a situation of the Wirtschaftswunder, the, you know, the economic miracle. So, you know, I think the problems here are completely of a different nature. Um, and, you know, without having some material conditions met in the first instance, it is going to be very difficult to, you know, make a case that people need to um, now deal with difficult issues from the past. Um, the other problem, I think, that needs to be raised here is the problem of the demographics and um, the demographic catastrophe that's actually unfolding uh, in the region. And, you know, again, this is a, a very different scenario from that of Germany um, in the 1960s. Um, where, and and the, the, the problems that this poses then for internal processes of dealing with the past. I mean, when you have a brain drain of those very people who would be you know, the main movers and the main sort of um, creating the demand and also in being involved themselves in processes of, of coming to terms with the past, well then that's not going to happen. You're leaving the space open to people who will counteract that. So I think the sort of the demographics and the economic situation need to be very much a part and parcel of any sort of discussion about uh, reconciliation and moving forwards. And I will end there. Thanks so much, Jasna. I think we are uh, sharp on time. We're just about to uh, reach the um, predicted uh, end time. Uh, this is at half past 12. Um, I would like, first of all, to thank all the speakers uh, very much for all they have contributed to our discussions. And uh, that was uh, really much, and it's a lot. And then also for, uh, to the audience, especially those asking questions uh, and for their attention and also for their own contribution to this. I want to announce a further event uh, of the Foreign Policy Forum for November and December. We will, you will receive the invitation in a usual uh, manner. In November, we plan to have uh, a debate on climate issues, uh, very topical, I think, taking the EU uh, summit in, in, in the United Kingdom. Um, and it will be online, so that uh, we will, we, we've now moved to the events uh, alive in person, but also we would like not, not to, to discontinue the, the online side uh, uh, of that. We will also have within this program of public diplomacy um, a lecture and a discussion on British foreign policy with a focus on the Western Balkans, sometimes uh, the end of November or beginning of December. And we plan to have a discussion on German foreign policy in an online format uh, in December, uh, expecting the government, the new government, to be formed in the Federal Republic, Germany, and to see you know, what we can actually expect. And uh, at the beginning of the next year, we plan to complete this uh, series of four events uh, related to, to the region, regional issues with a debate on the legacy of Yugoslavia from this perspective, uh, and also to bring the authors of recently published book from, um, uh, from Oxford, Exeter, Liverpool, and other places uh, here for another debate on what Yugoslavia means in this perspective of 30 years after, after its um, official landing in, in Croatia. So there will be plenty of opportunities to meet you again, and we all very much look forward to it. Thank you so much for coming, and see you soon.